All right, without the mic. Okay, cool. Let me try this without the mic. Because the mic, I think um, there's a bit of a, a room echo. Turn this off. All right. Okay. All right. So, good evening, everyone. Um, so, today I'd like to talk about my experience as a software engineer. So, some trials and errors that I've been through as a software engineer. And, well, Sometimes it's, it's not that easy to talk about these uh, mistakes that I've been through because sometimes it's, it's quite embarrassing <laughs> to, to really um, have a hard look at some of the mistakes I've done. So it's good that, you know, um, after 10 years of working, you know, I feel comfortable enough to basically stare at my mistakes <laughs> in the face and make sure I have been through it. That's fine. I've learned from it. And I can say that I probably won't repeat those mistakes ever again. All right. So for those who don't know, um, I'm a software engineer. Basically, uh, with more than a dozen years of uh, professional experience, and before that, I coded. Um, I've I've learned coding for more than ten years before I did it professionally. Uh, before I graduated from Monash Uni with double degrees, and one of the degrees is a com science degree. So that was quite a number of years ago. Um, that shall not count how many years exactly. All right. So after graduating, the first thing I did, obviously, uh, everybody do is basically go job hunting, basically, so get a job, go job hunting so that I can get paid, support myself, pay back my parents for all their years of providing me and uh, raising me to be a respectable member of the society, right? So it's typical, so I went out, looked for a job as a software engineer. And well, I learned from my mistakes, so some of you have uh, listened to my any of you uh, listened to my talk at Junior Dev who are here other than <laughs> All right. So yeah, learn from mistakes. So I sent out resumes. This time the resume has no typo in the phone number. It was one of my biggest mistakes I've ever done. So yep. Typo and phone number, you never get any calls. So like, why people know why am I not getting any jobs? No, because I have a typo. That's what happens, okay? So never repeat that mistake ever again. So I've written hundreds of resumes, sent them out, written hundreds of uh, cover letters. I keep a notebook, you know, to keep track of every single position that I've applied for. And I was sending out about 10 to 15 um, resumes a day, uh, about 40 to 50 resumes a week. So that's about the rate that we do uh, when we first started up job hunting. So any job post that I remotely qualify for, just apply, right? So that's what happens. So I did that for about four months before I finally got good enough at interviews. So that's typically how it works, right? Your first interview, you're never going to get a job because it's going to suck. So keep doing it until you finally get good, better at it so that you can, you know, land your first job. That's how it works, right? So definitely. Um, so what I, I don't remember any of the other interviews I've been for, but I only remember two of them, basically the one that I got my job for and another one that I basically was considering other than uh, the job that I'd taken up, right? So the interview uh, that I got my job for, it was actually done in a warehouse. So I was quite surprised. I went in, it was, there was no office, you know, it's just, it's just a warehouse. And basically it was a big um, room such as this. And literally it was just um, long tables, you know, those canteen tables, you see, long tables against the wall. And we were given um, sheets of uh, coding tests to do. So all of us, we, I can see not just myself, but basically uh, 30 other guys. I think I don't see any other girls in that room. I can't remember too much. But anyway, I, I, I noticed that plenty of guys um, lining the, the, the tables doing the test. And I was one of them doing it. So it's a big room. We did the test. It was one of those tests that, was, that made um, special impact uh, in my memory because it was actually a well-drafted coding test that doesn't really test the small little details like oh, how memory, how much uh, memory space would an uh, integer take in C, right? So they didn't ask um, very specific questions like polymorphism or stuff like that, no. But it was very straightforward. It, uh, it um, asked me to uh, a couple of... Um, Mathematical questions, you know, just get it over with. Couple of logical questions, couple of algorithmic questions, 
um, and a few puzzles to solve. The puzzles are the ones that take a bit more um, thinking, uh, problem solving, and did you all okay, well, it's pretty good, quite interesting, so I completed it. And just right there and then, uh, after I completed the, the test, uh, pass it uh, to somebody, can't remember who, and right there I waited for another guy to finish the interview and straight away did a face-to-face -face interview. And then, so I was pretty good with puzzles, so I was pretty, sorry, I was pretty good with puzzles, and so I was pretty confident with the test itself. So I okay, fine, I'll go in, go and do the interview. And one thing I really, I do remember about the interview that I had a pretty good conversation with the software manager and the tech lead for the uh, job that I'm supposed to be filling for. And I think I had a pretty good uh, conversation with them, so I was pretty, um, uh, pretty eager to work for this company. So I didn't hear back from them for about you know, three weeks or so. I was getting you know, a bit antsy. I said, am I getting a job or not? So the other interview that I remember was for a mailing company. Uh, mailing company, they, they do auto mails for, uh, for companies. So they sent out plenty, and, uh, plenty of mails for banks, for, for big marketing companies, for um, all that stuff, big merchants, insurance companies. So one thing I remember about the interview that they have a stipulation. Um, they were quite keen on me. I was quite keen on the job itself, but they do have a stipulation that was worrying me. They said that I can only um, take my annual leave in January and that's it. I was like, shit, if that happens, I'm never going back for Chinese New Year ever again. <laughs> and that's a big, you know, that's a big down, downside to it. It's like, what? Seriously? So I wasn't keen on that job right after that, you know, that stipulation. Mm, I don't really want this job anymore. So immediately, right there, I called up the other company that I've heard nothing of for three weeks. I called up, hey, um, how's, the, how's the application progress going? So, okay, I asked about it. And I was quite surprised, actually. So they immediately said, that, yes, 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 we want you, and we want to hire you. Um, you just need to go through some paperwork, and that's it. So it was right there, I got a a positive feedback from them. I was like, okay, that's good. So, phew, I, I don't have to accept the other job. I can now do this one. So, yeah, it was pretty good. So, I don't know whether or not it was because I, I did well, I was one of their top candidates or, you know, some other uh, candidates that they approached have already declined their offer. I don't know. But anyway, I, I'm just um, glad that I, I got a job, right? And count my lucky stars. So, then I was uh, in my first job, and then I realized why the interview was done in the workshop, why the, the coding test was done immediately, and then after I got my face-to-face -face interview, it was because they didn't actually have an office in Melbourne. So this was in Melbourne. They didn't actually have an office. Their, office was, their headquarters was actually in Sydney. So in Melbourne, it was just a, a warehouse. That's all they have. So I learned that I was the only developer to be working in <laughs> the warehouse. And basically, the other developer in Melbourne, he was working from home because his house was uh, two hours away from the warehouse. He was at North Sydney, and our warehouse was down at the south. Uh, sorry, North uh, Melbourne. Um, my, the warehouse was at South Melbourne. So, yeah, it was interesting. So it would have taken him two hours to get to work. So he worked from home most of the time. And basically, they needed a, a Melbourne um, tech representative for their Melbourne clients. So the other guy, he was handing calls, and I was to take over the ANZ um, client. So there was. So yeah, I was, I was perfectionist. I, I still am to a degree. <laughs> perfectionist being a Virgo and everything. So I was particular with you know, all the details, a lot of things. And this is my first job, so I wanted to learn basically everything, every single detail about the job so that I get it right, you know, stuff like that. And it was quite interesting, it was quite fun. So I was, I, I don't have a boss looking over my shoulder. That's a good thing about being the only developer in a warehouse, you know. My boss is actually not, not, not uh, present. So it was my chance to grow in a, a, a new environment, basically. To, I mean, these uh, situations where you get a new job, uh, face a new teammate and everything, it's a very good chance to grow without pre-existing expectations of your peers. And that was my chance. So I've made mistakes in uni, you know, I wanted to leave them behind. So this is my chance to, to me to start a new leaf, so to speak, you know. 
um, get some better experience. Hopefully, I've, I've left my mistakes behind and learned from my mistakes and not repeat them with a new batch of um, peers, new batch of colleagues. Right. Yeah, so that was it. So first job for the first two weeks, I got the, the guy who interviewed me, uh, the tele interviewed me, basically the first two weeks he, he was in Melbourne. Uh, he flew down from Sydney, came to Melbourne for the two weeks to basically uh, give me the, the spiel about the job, you know, what's required, the, the, how to start off and what's required and stuff like that. So pass, hand on basically the ANZ account to me from there. So I was, as I said, I was the only um, white collar worker in this warehouse. So it's quite... The, the warehouse manager, he was quite curious about why, you know, I, I can come in at 9.30 <laughs> in the morning, come in late in the morning and still, um, you know, I have crazy working hours. I, sometimes I, I typically would leave at 5.30 or 6 o'clock, 5.30 typically just so I, I can go to the shops for one last shopping. Because in, in Melbourne, everything closes at 5.30 slash 6 p.m. So I need to, you know, leave early if I want to grab anything from the shops. So sometimes I would do that, but um, obviously he doesn't, uh, I, I also sometimes stay late as well, that happens. But he was quite, because you know warehouse, they have qu quite um, set hours, you know, set working hours. So it was very different from the typical warehouse uh, worker that I was working with. And yeah, stuff like that, you know, quite interesting. Um, but those were, were, were my, 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 what do you call it? my colleagues also as well. well. These are people that you know, I have lunch break with, right? So it was quite interesting for me. And there were definitely scary moments as well where this is a warehouse out in far, far suburbs of Melbourne. And at night, I was typically by myself in the evening if I have to work late. I was I was the only person because the warehouse worker has left at 5.30, you know, later they would leave at 6. I would be the one locking up um, everything after that. So it was, I would have all by my lonesome, you know, I could watch Facebook, you know, watch video before I carry on with my work, that anything I would like to do, you know. But this one day, something scary really happened. I, I went to the washroom, came back to my big little warehouse, you know, empty, empty warehouse room. I, and literally, I have the whole warehouse room. I can basically have all my, all my gadgets, all my terminals spread across three desks. And, you know, it was fine. And I saw something dropped out of this hole at the corner of the room. And to me, it, it must be a rat. <laughs> it's nothing else. It's either a rat or, or a possum or something. But I, I'm thinking it must be a rat. It's too, too small for a possum. But it's huge. It was huge. Something just black just poop, dropped down. It's like, shit, I was damn scared. So what I do, I quickly just rush in, lock my computer, rush out. <laughs> that was it. That was scary. All right. So plenty of interesting stories to tell you about my first job. You know, how, um, I learned a lot during that first year. Um, I was the uh, go-to guy. I met clients. Um, I, my first, obviously, my, my uh, software managers would bring me, and the project managers would bring me to meet uh, the clients and after that, uh, after a while, after I got used to it, I was the one that um, do the, the work of uh, meeting the clients and everything. So I learned plenty of things. Learned not to request a 15-inch laptop, no matter, you know, a big screen size and everything like that because it sucks carrying around in high heels. You try it? Uh, no, not good. And also this was my one and only experience where, you know, I was a lady wearing, uh, wearing business suit and everything, carrying a heavy laptop and all the gadgets. Because I worked with um, terminals back then, um, you know, those uh, f post terminals, you start your credit cards with, so I have to bring those around with me when I meet the clients. And so I was carrying quite a few things, and this was in CBD, Melbourne, and this very gentlemanly guy basically let me get on the bus before him. He was very nice. Yeah, so that was my first and only experience of a gentleman doing that. Oh, it's interesting. <laughs> it was, right. And I learned many other things like how to get all these um, development uh, gadgets through the, F, uh, the airport security. Uh, learned to give estimation of work. You know, uh, my, my 
first one of my first, I think it was the first PM I had, or I think it must be, might be the second PM I had. He was really great. So he asked, you know, he just called from Sydney, oh, Yulin, you know, how long do you think you need to finish this project? So I looked through it, okay, um, X and X days, and said, okay, no worries, I'll just times three. And I learned right there and then. Any initial estimate I did, because developers' estimations are not accurate, right? I learned right there and then, any explanations I come up with, I times three. And the still works, the rule still works for me to this day. That's good. Yep. So, yep, answer technical questions, um, learn how to pack for suitcase for work trips, stuff like that. So, I was basically for that year, I was the lowest ranking person in the company, right, in the whole uh, team. So, I took any job that they throw at me, whatever it is, they throw it at me. After the first project, uh, uh, well, one of the, I think one of the first, yeah, after the first project I, that, that completed for ANZ, basically, so um, they had a law, and they basically they, they flew me to Sydney, and I, I get to get an all expenses paid trip to Sydney for a month, staying at a service apartment to work on a project for, I think it was Westpac, so it's pretty good. So the, the guy who was in charge of the Westpac project basically um, taught me uh, how to, uh, the, the the requirements of the project and stuff like that. I just did that, completed it, and also one of the other projects that I basically was tasked on. Lowest ranking person, you just get thrown all the different odd jobs here and there. So I was also uh, tasked to help another developer, well, another senior developer at that time to move, uh, to, to set up SVN. So we, at that point, we were moving from CVS to SVN. If uh, you are unfamiliar with CVS, it was one of the oldest, uh, co-versioning system, and then we move into uh, SVN, which uh, was quite popular before GitHub, right? And I did that, and when that developer, after a couple of months, he moved on to another company, I took over, and right there and there, I was named the SVN queen of the company. <laughs> yeah. That's how, that's how things get done, you know? The developer leaves, and you just take on whatever mentor that, you know, is thrown on you. So, I did not know at that time, basically, these people who basically taught me all these things, these are my mentors. And every senior developer who guided me on every single uh, project, they were teaching me things, right? These are the people who basically were teaching me their work experiences, their life experiences. Whether they were my manager, my PM, or the QA manager themselves, you know. And I think, I think that was the part that I was proud to have done right. Uh, so to speak, in the sense where I would do the research on any new projects, right? They pro and then basically they would, uh, I would ask the required questions, they would provide me with the links on how to get the information. Um, as a perfectionist, what I do, I read through everything that they sent me, you know, and find the answers in them. Only when I cannot find, after I read through all the, the information I could find of uh, Google or anywhere, then only I would ask for uh, ask them for help for any other stuff, and there was a trick basically. Um, when it comes to uh, these people, make sure you do your own homework, right? Because the mentors are not the one to be doing the homework for you. They are not the one that will be doing the homework for you and then tell you the answers. No, that's not how it works. These are mentors are people who are available to guide you to where to find these answers for yourself. And these are people that, to this day, I'm still thankful for, you know. So those are the great stuff. And basically, these are more of the same of happening, basically, for the second year uh, of my workplace. And slowly, you know, I find my place uh, in the workplace hierarchy. Um, I find my groove at the workplace. So it's pretty good. But... Because I was the only developer in um, the Melbourne office, so I, one of the things that I did not get to practice on was my social skills or uh, workplace politics skills because there wasn't much of it in the warehouse, you know. So it was, well, it was, it was good fun for me. It was, it was a good chance for me to grow without having to um, bother with all the, uh, all the distraction, so to speak. Um, one other than learning how to drink in a Christmas party, so that was important in Austri uh, any Australian workplace, learn how to drink, you must need to know, <laughs> learn how to drink. So it was quite important, it was interesting. And yeah, so it wasn't until I think it was about third year that they hired um, 
uh, more people in, they brought more people in to help out with the ANZ uh, work because oh, I did a good job, so ANZ likes us, so they <laughs> give us more work to do. That's how it works, right? Well, maybe, no, not really, but anyway. <laughs> so we had more work to do, so we hired more people. And by the end of it, I was a tech lead, tech lead for a team of two or three people, I think. The most people we had, I had un, not quite under me, but in my same team was uh, four other people in my team. So it was quite interesting for, for a junior developer to uh, basically to advance the rank quite, quite fast, so to speak. But yeah, so the first two developers they, they hired in were fresh grads also. And Point, I was still a junior developer, so there's a lot of things I still did not, you know, uh, caught on, so to speak. And I did not realize that I was actually setting a bad example for these two fresh grads. So, I mean, what I did was basically they came in, I, I did for them exactly what was done to me. So I, I basically showed them the ropes the way it was shown to me. So, and that was it. So I went back to my, um, my bad attitude of surfing the internet <laughs> whenever that uh, I have free time for. So typically that's what happens, right? Uh, I, that's what we find ourselves, well, what, that's what I find myself doing, that I realize that you know, my, brain, my brain power only works up to a certain you know, limit, and then I have to let it rest a bit. That's what I do. I don't have a pinball machine like they have in the Sydney office. So I, do, I, surf, uh, I go on Facebook a little bit, you know, watch a few videos before I get back to my work. You know, let my brain rest a little bit, then only go back. So, but this, kind of indicated to these two fresh grads that it was okay. That was an expected thing to do. And yikes, I didn't know that I was setting a bad example for them. So yeah, so the, unfortunately, that's actually what happened. So these two guys, one of them, he's not that, um, he's not that smart as a developer, so he takes a long time, you know, uh, getting to find bugs or even coming up with a piece of code, which is, I think, which, which is fine to a certain degree, you know, everybody have their own pace of learning. But the other guy, he was a self-proclaimed genius. And, well, to me, he was a big, fat, lazy <laughs> person. And so he was quite obese person, and he has hair, you know, like flowing blonde hair up to his butt. <laughs> very long princess hair, he really likes to flick his hair all the time. I get annoyed if I ever sit next to him and fix and flicks his hair. Anyway, so these two guys, they kind of like feed on each other's bad habits, unfortunately. So the, the genius guy thinks that, oh, you know, he have this other guy, he's so much smarter than this other guy, you know, he can do work a lot faster than this other guy. So it's okay for him to slack off, you know, since um, he's, he's uh, meeting his quota for the day, you know, if he meets the other guy's job. And basically, the other guy thinks that, you know, I'm the one doing all this hard work, you know, I'm not like the other guy uh, surfing the internet, so I must be doing a good job. So these two guys, and I myself, I was kind of oblivious because I have my own work, to, I have own my jo own job to do, so okay, fine. And I didn't realize until almost a year when they are, I think after six months or something like that, when their probation and, and my manager flew down and asked me quite particular questions about these two guys. I said, is it true that you know uh, who and who you know goes on the internet quite often? And I said, yeah, he has been doing that almost a whole day sometimes. So yeah, stuff like that. I did not really be aware of that it was a problem until my manager came down and basically questioned me, you know, interrogate me about um, the, the the newbies. And so what happened was that the manager had to uh, make a decision. So he actually told um, the 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 self-proclaimed genius that, you know, he is no longer allowed to surf the internet. So anything that he does on the internet has to be about the job. If he is ever found, you know, surfing the internet from then on, well, he's not allowed to, he didn't actually say if he was ever found, but he basically straight away tell him, you know, you're no longer allowed to surf the internet, make sure that you are, uh, you are actually doing work while you are at the office, you know. Um, do not ever abuse uh, internet privileges ever again. And he did that, I think, only for a couple of days. I don't think he lasts through the week. I mean, my manager had to fly back to Sydney, right? So he has other stuff to do. So uh, I definitely, I had, I was, you know, tasked to report on these guys. So I had to tell my manager, so, yeah, sorry, I have to say that he's still <laughs> surfing the internet. So right then and there, he was really given the ultimatum. 
they fired him after a month. And unfortunately, the other guy kind of took that as um, his saving grace. So he served through his whole year, and he was uh, basically still on, still on. Uh, I wasn't sure whether he was still on contract, but he he served through uh, his probation, which was six months, and then basically after the one year mark, he was kind of saying, "I know I should, probably shouldn't be getting fresh grad pay anymore." So he actually. Uh, went and gave in uh, his own ultimatum and said that oh you have to raise my pay otherwise I'll quit and I said okay we'll let, let you go <laughs> right there and there right so what's what's going on here right so these two guys <laughs> and so after that well luckily for me uh, at that point in time they managed to hire two more uh, more experienced guys in so one of them was uh, quite a senior uh, developer who came in from a, set, a diff totally different industry and they got another guy from the manila team to uh, to basically uh, relocate to melbourne and basically uh, work on the project so it was quite unfortunate for this newbie who's uh, still the lowest ranking member of the office to put in his ultimatum at the wrong timing. So what was the, what was the um, lesson that is basically you need to be humble sometimes, you know. It doesn't matter what stage of your career you are in sometimes. As long as you, you join a new team, you are the newest member. You have to uh, be humble to learn about the work environment, learn about the new team, because they are not going to, uh, to, to do the same for you because you are the new person. Right? Even to this day, it's still the same no matter which new team I join, whether it's internal, uh, internal transfer from different departments or it's a new job, new company. If you are the new person, you have to be humble about yourself. You have to learn get a very good gauge of the team, the situation, the work, before you give an ultimatum like uh, what the Freshie did. Right. Need to learn the different styles of working and all that. So there I was, you know, into my fourth year of my first job and yeah, so at that time, yeah, I was really, I was getting used to the job scope and everything. I was slowly starting to branch out to uh, non-work related activities like uh, learning Japanese, you know, anything or whatever. Because there was, uh, they were giving French lessons. Um, so that company I was working for was a French company. So there was some of the colleagues in Sydney were giving French lessons. I said, oh, I want to learn Japanese. So I tried to find a Japanese uh, lessons in Melbourne and I could not find any. That was the tough part about being down under. There's no entertainment after work hours. And there, I found, I think I found one or two uh, people giving out Japanese lessons, but these were lessons during the work hours. These are for um, housewives or students, basically, not for people like me who already have a job. Why would I go and learn Japanese? No way. <laughs> so there's stuff like that. So I, I went and grabbed my, uh, I think this Japanese lessons book that my sister and my mother, uh, when my mother was working in a Japanese condominium, uh, opening a beauty salon in a Japanese condominium, so she learned about two, three months of Japanese. So I took their books and I learned by myself in, in uh, Melbourne. Right. So it was then, uh, three and, about three and a half years working in Melbourne, it was then that one day, basically, I, on my, I was driving to work that I got a phone call on my uh, cell phone. So the minute I got to the office, you know, I picked up the call and basically my mother had called me to tell me my father has passed away. So it was a shock and a pretty tough period of my life back then. So all three of us, uh, me and my siblings, all of us basically uh, took um, one, all, all of us were working, you know, outside of KL. Uh, me and my brother was in Melbourne. So at that time, I immediately called my brother and bought the first ticket back to KL. My sister was at London, uh, so she actually arrived back at KL almost more, more than a day um, after me and my brother. So we all took about one month's uh, compassionate leave. And both of me and my brother, the minute we get back to Melbourne to our job, we tried to get the transfer back home or as close to home uh, as we could. So at that time, uh, they didn't have an office in KL, so I got a transfer back to Singapore. 
it was okay for me because I studied in Singapore before. So got transferred back to Singapore. My brother, he got a transfer to the KL office. And my sister, basically what she did was she worked long distance from KL for more than a year for uh, her company at that time. So it was tough times, uh, but we dealt with it bravely. And yeah, as best as we could. So I was in Singapore, got transferred back to Singapore and continued working the same way as I did in Melbourne, you know, it's the same company, so I didn't really expect things to be any different, so to speak, it's the same type of job. And that was when I realized uh, I got my culture shock, my second culture shock, first culture shock was working for Aussie company and learning to drink beer. So this is my second culture shock as I come back to Singapore and <laughs> realized that actually the Singapore work at this is just so much different from Australia. Oh dear, right. So. And I, I just, to this day, I, I think I still could not get used to the Singapore working style. And basically, what happens, I definitely do not stay late after hours if I can help it, because there's just so much brain power I can, you know, I can accomplish in a day. No matter how late I work, nothing is going to come out, right? No, no programming is going to come out after a certain uh, period. If it's root work, like, um, uh, like, like uh, production, uh, sorry, uh, putting to production uh, uh, application, that's fine, you know, those things don't need uh, brain power. But most of the work you do every day is bug fixing, stuff that actually requires brain power. So I definitely realized that, you know, it's much better if I actually come in to work in the weekends than if I just work through uh, 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. and stuff like that, right? Not that I did, but it wasn't common at all. I typically just come in. Uh, 9, 9.30 and go home 5 or 6 o'clock and know that, okay, my brain is dead by now. That's it. So, yeah, but, and I didn't realize it. So my new supervisors in Singapore, they didn't understand. <laughs> they totally did not understand that. So my software manager, what happened? I was like, wow, well, my first software manager. So he tried to set KPIs for me. And I, I was... Blur at that time, I have, I could not understand the motivation to set KPIs for myself. I mean, at that point when I was in uh, working in the Melbourne office, I was getting uh, a pay raise every single year. You know, clockwork. I did a good job. That I get a pay raise. I get a ten percent pay raise every single year for the first three years uh, in Melbourne. And I kind of like expected that to continue happening in Singapore. But no, he put he called me a uh, called a meeting in his office and tr basically tried to sign get me to sign this form saying, oh, if I, if I did a good job uh, for each quarter, I'll get this much uh, bonus. I, I do not get the motivational speech from him. I, I said, okay, fine, I'll sign. After I sign, I'll go back and do exactly what I did. I did not change any way you know, of my working style. And basically, the, the, the next, the, when the time comes for me to actually present me with my bonus, because uh, I have completed my KPI, which I've done nothing differently to, to com get whatever KPI he set for me. So I just got the bonus and I said, like, okay, thank you. And he was, he was you know, trying to explain you know, how it works to me and trying to get me to feel motivated now that I've got my bonus. I totally did not get it. Oh, well. It made it very official. But oh, well. And that was it. I signed it and that was it. And Oh, well, to me it was like, yeah, okay, so, so what, right? And that was one of the things that I probably, um, around that time that I started learning that I probably shouldn't show my thoughts that easily, you know. I should probably be a bit more, uh, uh, a bit more understanding, try, try, <laughs> Well, at that time, I couldn't understand, of course, but definitely make a bit more effort to compromise in terms of how I do things, right? And yeah, I was very stubborn back then. I was, I'm still quite a stubborn person right now, but at least now I think I've learned to not speak my mind so much, actually listen to people first uh, before making any uh, assumptions. And I think I've learned a little bit from then. Well, so here I was in Singapore uh, doing the same job, uh, but totally different from Melbourne where I 
it was only after I quit that I realized that, hey, I was actually doing more support work than R&D work, than actually uh, design uh, architect development work, which was expected of me in Melbourne. And at that point, it was pretty much a downhill spiral for me, right? So I did not actually get much satisfaction from work at that point. So I was starting to look out for extracurricular activities. And in Singapore, there's just so many. You know, it's not like in Melbourne, there's nothing. Here, there's just plenty on plenty of distraction, distractions for me to, you know, uh, go with. So I took uh, Japanese lessons, um, took the N4 entry exams and stuff like that. And I, at that time was when I actually started taking a CELTA course to actually get a certificate to teach English to adults. So because I, I did the Japanese uh, lessons, right? So there are a couple of people in there who, was, who are basically uh, looking to get a job in Japan because Singapore uh, have a, a agreement with the Japan uh, MOE to basically you, there's a way for you to teach English to, in Japan uh, for a year as long as you're under 30 and a Singaporean. I didn't have that for, because I was a Malaysian. So, oh well, anyway, I give it a try anyway. So, it was shortly after that that I finally got fed up after two years in Singapore. And at that time, I was sent by my then manager to give IT support in Hong Kong. And now it wasn't anything you know, I've been doing that uh, on and off. Basically, I went to Thailand to support uh, and then to Hong Kong. But this one was a bit more critical at that time. And basically, I was needed to support our client's vendor in Hong Kong for a pilot of uh, one of the terminals. So I went to Hong Kong that weekend. And I wasn't uh, smart enough to actually, uh, actually go and plan for my traveling to happen during the work hours. So I wasn't smart enough to do that. So when I actually uh, go and book the tickets, it was typically after work hours, you know, whether at night, in the evening, or in the weekend. And that makes it very, very tiring because as soon as I, I come off the airplane in Singapore, I have to go back to the office and work, and vice versa. So it was quite tiring. And basically, in addition to basically a full work uh, week in the Singapore office, I still have to go and support the Hong Kong uh, sites in the weekends. So that was that. So I asked my boss, is it okay if you just let me stay in Hong Kong for the week instead of me flying back and forth over the weekend, you know, uh, again and again? And he refused because a flight ticket to Hong Kong is cheaper than a stay in a Hong Kong hotel. What the cheapo? So I was like, and that was how I actually hit my limit. I was like, shit, this is not working. After three trips in a same month, three trips separately to Hong Kong in the same month, I was tired, I was dead exhausted. And that was it. The, the, after the third trip, I come back from Hong Kong, I immediately draft my resignation letter and submitted it. And that was it. <laughs> right. That was the stint of my, uh, my, my first job. So that was uh, how I tried to basically change career path at that point. So I've now completed, at that point, I've completed about five years of work. And I was thinking I was basically hitting my quarter life crisis at that time. So that's what happens, you know, you, you, you work day in, day out, and you suddenly think that, is there something more to life, right? <laughs> so I tried, I mean, at that time I had Remember, I had two degrees from uh, uni. One was common science, and the other one was uh, sociology. So I actually majored in sociology and minored in uh, anthropology. So I was quite interested, really. I mean, anthropology was actually a very, very interesting subject. I would have learned, like to learn more. So that's why I wanted to you know, go to a different country, learn a different culture. And of course, I learned Japanese, so I picked Japan. And I got a certificate to teach English to adults. That's what the type of jobs I searched for. And of course, if you some of you might have expected this. So Japanese don't actually want a Chinese Malaysian to teach them English. They want somebody with an English name. They want somebody white, Caucasian, you know, to teach um, them English. So they didn't hire me. I couldn't get a job. No way. So after six months, okay, at that point, I moved back to KL to live with my mom so I didn't have to pay any rent. So it was pretty cool. That was actually the only period where I did not have a high blood pressure. So I had hyper pressure for quite a while since uh, you know since uh, uni already, since uni I had hyper pressure. I was taking medications uh, by the time I, I joined the workforce, so it was quite bad. But at that time, I actually started to win off because my mother at that time she was also taking high blood pressure uh, medicine, and they suspect that it might be a, a, 
uh, because of uh, familiar um, and traits. But not quite also, I, I don't believe that also. So she was telling me, oh, once you start on the high blood, everybody was telling me this, that once I start on high blood pressure medication, there's no way I can get off it. That's it for life. But no, I managed to. So I weaned myself off the medication. I think when I was still in, I can't remember. I think I was still in uh, Australia at that time. I weaned myself off the medication slowly. So slowly, basically uh, from one pill a day to half a pill, to quarter, to I literally every day go and chop the pills into half, into a quarter, and I slowly wean myself off. So during that time, uh, when I was staying with my mother in KL, surprisingly, my blood pressure was normal. That was very surprising. My, my mother, you know, one time, my mother basically had to force me to take, um, take my blood pressure level because I was very lazy to do it myself, right? I was, oh, just do it. I was playing computer games, fine, okay, do it. And she was so surprised that it was normal. I was surprised too. <laughs> so you know, it, was quite, it was quite a good, you know, um, good break from, from work, from, from the stressful lifestyle, from Singapore stressful lifestyle, of course. So it's quite interesting. But of course, I didn't get a job in Japan, so my, my deadline that I've set for myself has come and passed. So what I do, so I came back to Singapore, and I look for a job in Singapore, basically as a software engineer again. So I, I, I think I applied for both software engineering jobs as well as uh, English teaching jobs. But to be honest, the software engineering jobs are the ones that pay better. So obvious choice. <laughs> yeah, so that was how it worked out. Uh, after one year I, uh, of, of not working, almost one year, almost one year, because I joined a competitor company. And because of that, I have to uh, serve out that one year non-competitive, uh, non-competition clause. So I joined a competitive company and they sent me straight back to Australia. So, yep. So I guess it was happenstance, so to speak, um, that no Singapore company wants me. They sent me straight back to Australia. <laughs> I work better in Australia, I guess. So yeah, they sent me straight back to Australia. So I worked in Australia for, so basically they sent me to have the orientation. So initially they expected me to uh, do my orientation for two months in Sydney. But uh, for the, uh, when I uh, end up there, they finally managed to uh, uh, basically got an acquisition through for a New Zealand company at that time. So I was sent for the second month, I was sent to uh, the New Zealand office to uh, do, serve out my orientation, so to speak. So that's how I find myself working for New Zealand. <laughs> so it was interesting. So for about six months, I was getting paid in Sing dollars, basically uh, um, getting uh, signed through a contract job in Singapore and basically working for, for uh, New Zealand uh, company, uh, New Zealand office. So it's quite interesting and only after that, after that six months, I finally push and push and push. Basically, they keep giving me a temp contract. So they keep saying, oh, there's hiring freeze. I can only get you on as temp contract again and again and again until I put down my foot. I gave them ultimatum right there. So this is my turn to give an ultimatum and say, no way, if you're not going to give me a, a contract, if you're not going to get me on as a permanent employee, I'm not continuing this. I'm looking elsewhere for a job. I'm not continuing as a temp. There's no way. So that's it. That's okay, fine. They got me a, a contract. So at that time, that was how I find myself being an expat in New Zealand. And it was great fun. <laughs> it was great fun being an expat, I must say. Um, they paid for... So I, I argued for quite a few things. I demanded quite a few things. I just say not argued. I demanded quite a few things. And you know, they they paid for my rent in New Zealand. So it was great. They paid for my rent. Um, they paid for my initial what they call a relocation um, package, so to speak. They, so basically, uh, they gave me some the company money. I can get the company a credit card and went to buy things like uh, pillows, uh, pillowcase, bed sheets, and stuff like that. Right to uh, supplement, put on the... And New Zealand has space. So I, the, the cheapest uh, apartment I could get was a two-bedroom apartment. It was great. So yeah, a two-bedroom apartment all to myself. Yeah, it was pretty good. And New Zealand is a very interesting country. I find I learned a lot uh, uh, 
about the country itself. And to, do you realize that New Zealand is actually one of the most technologically advanced country around the world? Interesting because they have such a they are so far out from the general world. Um, uh, what do you call it? The world flow that they are they are outside of they are outside of most of the influences of the world. So they are the furthest, the southmost country uh, of the world, right? And basically, they have the right size population, same population size of Singapore, but with just a bigger land mass, more 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 ships than men, <laughs> of course. Yeah, stuff like that. So what happens is that a lot of companies, what they do when they test out a new tech product, they test it in New Zealand. It was the ideal place for them to test new tech. And it was the one of, basically, they were the first country to have 3G and then 4G. Like, once 3G came out, in less than a year, 4G was out in New Zealand. I bought a 4G phone immediately, of course, and I came back to Singapore and realized I can't use it in Singapore. I can only use it in New Zealand. So for more than six months, that 4G phone, I cannot use it in Singapore. I cannot use it in Malaysia. I can only use it in New Zealand. So that's interesting. And every single household has a has a, a dishwasher. And in the office, there's actually dishwasher etiquette. So that's where I learned different skills. So it's quite interesting. And well, I want to tell you this story. That's uh, something else to eat. So at that time, uh, I was pretty much almost a, a senior developer at that point, right? So I was uh, getting paid expat pay and stuff like that. And they got a new manager in at that point. So the first manager that actually got me into uh, uh, into New Zealand, he knew my worth. So he was willing to pay all these things, willing to uh, basically smoothen out as long as I continue working for them. But the new manager, he did not have that space. So he thought I was overpaid. So I didn't realize that, you know, they, do, they have one-on-ones at the time. So he called me in for a one-on-one over a coffee. And basically, just chit-chatted, you know. I told him my ideas about how uh, our next step is for the team and stuff like that, all those things. And then by the end of the one-on-one, he basically dropped a comment that stayed to me to this day. He said that uh, we were just chit chatting after that, you know, after the one on one session, just chit chat, chit chat, chit chat. And he suddenly realized something, I guess, from the chit chatting, and he told me, oh, so that's why you needed so much money to support your lifestyle. I said, what? <laughs> right? I earn so much because I deserve it. Not because I need to support my lifestyle, not because I'm... To him, I'm a single woman. I don't need that much money. He has a family to support. He needs some money. It has nothing to do with that, right? I earned what I paid. I worked hard for it. But right then and there, I realized something. He's never ever going to give me a pay raise, right? So right then and then, I decided I'm never going to renew my contract with New Zealand office. Yeah, so things like that. It, it's very important to realize your own worth. Sometimes trust your own worth. Trust in yourself. Don't let other people, you know, demean you uh, or put you down in any way possible. You know, you have your own. Um, keep to your own pride. It's nothing to do with being humble. But know your own worth. Don't let other people put you down. So, I guess. Um, that's all the time I have for today. I think I've, I've just spoken quite a long time, so you must be tired of my stories by now. But I hope you find that interesting. And yeah, thank you.